there's one other trend that's really positive. I don't know if you call it a trend uh, or a happening um, that, that I think has been great. And that's what, it, and I'm going to say it is kind of the, the, the convergence of what we might say it, where, where sort of this continuum of social entrepreneurship to social innovation to social enterprise is kind of the growing of this continuum. That's kind of leading to this notion of convergence where sort of for-profit, not-for-profit combine in new kinds of organizational structures that are, that are often market-based, right? They're just not responding to sort of optimal profit, profit generation, challenging you know, a, a pure for-profit model. So you're seeing that combined with um, a, a notion of shared value in the private sector. It's early days, and it was, you know, I mean, Porter just named it. I don't know, I think he discovered it necessarily, but Michael Porter, you know, wrote this paper. Yeah, yeah, and he had the name that helped, you know, brand it. And who here, have you all have you, You know, so you know, so, but it, but I thought what was interesting is a little bit of the typology where you look at, you, you know, whether it, you know, and he talks about three areas where shared value is most likely to happen, right? So whether it is reconceiving products and services that can tackle a social issue and a company can make money, or whether it is sort of what you might call, you, you know, last mile it, value chain, you know, connecting value to global value chains or regional value chains or local value chains to really poor poor folks plugging them in to that or the third is sort of he talks about cluster and ecosystems and i think he's w weaker on that but but this but yeah that's right yeah so but but the, but the but the conversation is interesting and, and because i because my own organization um, you, you know, looks at that as a tremendous opportunity. And we look at it as an opportunity, you know, for very practical reasons, right? And as some that you all, you know, would be really aware of. In part, most sort of recovery development work, almost anywhere in the world, this dates me, when I started, you know, in, in these really tough countries, you know, official development assistance was about 80% of, of foreign investment and 20% private investment, right? Now it's reversed, almost everywhere, including a Somalia, right? It's just reversed. So if you're going to leverage impact, it's going to, you know, you better find ways to plug into that marketplace because that's where the real resources are, right? And secondly, we know that's more sustainable than other forms of resources. And third, I think because of this notion of convergence, we actually think there's some real power there. There's real potential, um, some real potential there. Um, so you all tell me when you want to stop, and I, I mean, I can, you know, but I just want to give you a couple of examples, you know, drawn from Mercy Corps, and I'd love your thoughts and some of the challenges um, that we have. Um, so first example is, um, um, there's some folks here from Indonesia, right? Is, yeah, I don't know if you're, so if you take microfinance, all of you are familiar with microfinance, and it's been an important tool uh, in the toolkit of development and the toolkit of financial inclusion, right? In terms of reaching certain people. It's been criticized for a number of reasons, but one of the really legitimate points of criticism is that most microfinance, whether you kind of, you think of Grameen or BRAC, some of these big, you know, groups that came out of Bangladesh, or you think of, it's been retail led. And you haven't had the same architecture ecosystem that you, that characterizes most commercial banking, right? And so if you want to introduce new products and services, it's kind of one institution at a time, right? Not through an ecosystem. Well, Indonesia is one of the world's largest microfinance markets. Um, you know, 50 million people get financial services through, you know, some kind of small micro or small financial delivery system. 40 million people are still unbanked. You're not going to reach the other 40 million by retail, by retail, by retail, right? And so what we wanted to test is creating a wholesale bank that's a for-profit regulated by the Central Bank of Indonesia, which we did with the IFC 
with other sort of European development investors and some private investors. And, but the key is building a technology platform that connects, let's say, the 2,000, 2,500 strongest microfinance institutions. So through that technology platform, at scale, you can introduce innovative products and services like mobile banking, like microinsurance, like pick your, your product or service. So that's, that's one, you know, and we, and we treated it, I mean, we were lucky in that we got an initial significant grant from Gates Foundation to support it. They allowed six million of their grant to be used as equity. Mercy Corps became, interesting, the ultimate shareholder with, as I said, the IFC, some of the European development finance institutions, I, I won't name them, you, some of you will know what they are, and some private investors, right? But that's, so there, and, and it's, you know, it's growing, it's attracted much more outside uh, financial capital, more inside, uh, you know, it's still small, it's now like a, a, a $300 million bank, it's, you know, reaching out to about 5 million end users right now through the network. But the, but the key is, is that technology platform? And this is a pure for-profit model of trying to solve an ecosystem challenge with microfinance in one of the world's largest, most dynamic microfinance markets. So that's one example. And ours is can you, you know, how do you navigate the regulatory environment? How do you really go to scale? How do you get uptake? You know, how do you get a technology system that works? Because now it's past the break-even mark. You know, we did the business plan, treated it. It is, you know, as I said, it was losing money on schedule for its first uh, two years. And then on schedule, it started making money. And the challenge there is the temptations to do the low-hanging fruit to make money get in the way of being more risky around the technology platform and investing in that and the uptake, which is the ultimate home run from a social standpoint, right? So that's one. The second, totally different, but since Ian brought up Haiti, is, you know, is so, it, it, you know, we all know what happened in Haiti a number of years ago with the earthquake. Hopefully an earthquake is, um, you know, a once in a 500 year or longer cycle. Um, but, but folks in Haiti, and particularly poor folks, storms every year come through and destroy assets, right? And so the question was, how do you bring micro insurance, you know, to folks so that they have, you know, one that they've they've got the the you know, the, the real comfort to take some risk. They're not going to lose everything if they invest, uh, you know, if they invest in their businesses or if they invest in expanding agriculture or if they hire people, you know, that when the the storms come through and destroy the crops every year, that there's something they can draw back. And how do you do it in a sustainable way? And so we, with a microfinance institution and Swiss Re, created a microinsurance company because in Haiti, the regulatory environment hadn't quite evolved. We could, it, it's getting there, but so we had to set it up in the Caribbean, interestingly enough, and again, set up an interesting facility that allowed outside investors to come into it. And now the challenge is, okay, how do you expand this? And it's, already, it's paid out now close to $10 million um, to small borrowers, you know, who are, you know, who take a loan from microfinance institutions. So it's paid out quite a bit. It has attracted outside investment. So, so with Swiss Re, the challenge is now, can you use this as a model to grow throughout the Caribbean, in Africa, and in Asia? Part of the innovation is not just sort of a last mile solution to bring risk insurance that many people take for granted to poor people but it is sort of getting playing with the business model so where you get a blend of, I don't want to get too technical, of parametric insurance, which means a payout is triggered by a weather event, amount of rainfall, wind speed, not by damages, right? And but so everybody, if the, the threshold is crossed, gets a payout, right? And then, but mixing that with indemnity, which is basically assessment of damages, right? And there's often certain limits on that, but that's, so it's blending it to get, so you're innovating not only in the partnership and the structure, but you're innovating around the actual product. And so that's where I think it falls into that kind of shared value. For us, and the value was, Swiss Re doesn't know how to work with poor farmers. They have no connection. So we become, and you were talking to one of my colleagues, that, that last mile, you know, I like to call it the first mile, though, you know, so the first mile. Um, 
connector. One of the biggest challenges, and this is a question that I think for all of it, is that the so-called last mile, first mile challenge. If you take a company like Unilever, do, does everyone know Unilever? Sort of one of these big consumer products companies. Yeah, you know everything about Unilever. Okay, so, well, no, yeah, so Unilever, <coughs> you know, has got a very enlightened CEO, a strong commitment to want to bring smallholder farmers. They look out, there's, depending on who's counting, there are 500, 600 million smallholder farmers in the world, right? And could we, as a way to boost their incomes, boost their productivity, bring them into these global value chains, right? And, 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 and so Unilever's very committed, or Pepsi might be very committed, Walmart is very committed. But when you really look at it and analyze it, it's mostly, you know, boutique -y exercises. There aren't many examples of anyone being successful at scale. And it's because, and this is the, this is the real chat, this is what, if I were in your show, I'd be so excited about because the person who figures out the business model in that last mile, first mile, is, should win whatever, the Nobel Prize for something. Because that is, that is where it breaks down, right? Is how do you, at scale, right, bring smallholder farmers, for example, we can pick other industries, you know, into global value chains so that their products, they can grow enough there's a sufficient kind of quality. You can manage the supply chains cost effectively to serve a global marketplace or a, reg a large regional. You don't even have to be a global, a large regional market. But who figures that out, that's going to be potentially powerful. But, I, but we think there may have to be a new business model than what has been conceived that can allow that to happen. When I look at the future on the things we have to get right, is, you know, in light of these trends that I talked about, you, you know, when I started out, uh, when I started out this morning, it, you know, that's where I spend a lot of my time. And it really is in three or four big areas. One is, is you know, we, we, as an international organization with strong Western roots, we have to figure out how to partner with these new powers who are increasingly becoming major players in the places that we work. And that's not going to be a tradition. If you look at a lot of the, the, the older legacy groups, whether it's Save the Children or Oxfam, or you know, they, their relationships um, with other country, non-Western countries tend to be based around resources they've built. And I just don't, that's not going to work with China, with Turkey. You know, it's really about partnerships. And so what does that look like? You know, what kinds of partnerships? How, which is why I'm excited about you know, an emerging Chinese NGO to be doing joint work. But I'm figuring out going global in this new world is really critical. Um, secondly, you know, figuring out these diverse revenue streams and business models, you know. So I do, I honestly do think, I don't think we'll be called NGOs in five to ten years. Now. In part, in many places of the world, NGO has a negative connotation. And not just, and also from a lot of the new groups that we really want to hire and partner with, a lot of the social innovation groups look at traditional NGOs as dinosaurs, right? Now, I think they're a little bit short-sighted because they've had a hard time moving beyond boutique -y stuff. And, and, and traditional NGOs have had a hard time being really innovative. But if you could marry those platforms and experience with a lot of that energy, that just seems like a great partnership waiting to happen. So I'd hope to do some of that. And then, the, you know, the final is the, the, the kind of cultural areas of any organization. I think if you get culture right, it, uh, most everything else follows. So if you can create a culture that attracts great people, that helps them be their best, that celebrates, you know, kind of the right kind of risk taking and results, you know, is appropriately caring um, and is global right, in its manifestations. You know, easier said than done, um, but if you can get that right, you know, I do think that most everything else, you, you know, will follow, because you'll, you know, as you, are, you all were saying, what's the most important resource? Well, you know, it's always human capital, right? And if you can get the right people, you, you'll mostly figure out the right ways forward and the strategies for impact. And I think that's a very important part of, I mean, and some of you, you know, and the, one of the reasons I travel so much that I think is critically important is I do feel it's really important that I go, you know, to the front lines of our, in some of the toughest places, like, 
you know, I've been inside Syria and across border and on the, you know, in the really dangerous areas. Not so much so I can add to our strategy, but in large measure to say thank you. Or I go to Helmand. You know, people, you know, as this foreigner running around Helmand in Afghanistan, and in part because I want to say thank you, you know, to the people on the front lines. And I think that's, you know, maybe the most important thing <laughs> that, I, um, that I do.